conflict. So I sat down on the airplane, 11 o'clock at night, transatlantic flight. Several months ago, the pleasantries ex- exchanged. I almost said explained, which happened too. Because, what's your name? What do you do? Well, I'm a pastor. Sometimes that cuts off the conversation. What do you do? Well, I'm a therapist. A therapist, really? Well, I'm starting a sabbatical. What do you do as a therapist? Well, I help people work through conflict. Really? Eleven o'clock at night, fell asleep for a little bit, woke up, person beside me is awake. So Sam, tell me what's going on in your life. So I actually said, so are you inviting me to like check in at the office? They said, yes, it's on the house. Seven hour therapy session. (laughs) Working through some things that I was not even aware of in my life related to conflict. Some external, a lot internal. And it was so good. Last week we mentioned news. If you're watching right now, the conflict between nations is rising. Within our nation, conflict between parties is a problem. Maybe Christmas emphasizes for you conflict in your family, or students, maybe even your friend groups. And as you pass all of that, right, the conflict that might even be internal happening in your own heart and in your own life, maybe related to some of that and maybe not even related to any of that, maybe just for you, y'all know, right, the internal stuff that's getting all the press right now that seems to be going there wrong direction inside conflict what does Christmas have to do with the conflict on earth if you have a Bible I want to invite you to ask God don't worry I'm not going to give you a seven hour therapy session right now but I'm going to invite you to ask God to speak into your life this great Advent theme that was announced at Christmas some 2,000 years ago, peace. As we open Luke 2, and I want to invite you to find it, if you don't have a Bible, there should be a black one again in the pew there in front of you. Uh, We want to let you borrow it. If you don't own one, that's yours. We want to give it to you as an early Christmas present. Or you can find it on an electronic device. Luke 2 tells us the Christmas story. And the story many of you are familiar with. Many of us have heard this story before. Not all. If if it's new, I'm so glad you're going to get to hear it today. But we want to move past just the details of what happened to what's really happening at Christmas. Uh, Meaning, and we've said it this way uh, to try to get it stuck in our head, we want to end this time to look through the history to the theology of the nativity. Uh, what, What do I mean? Well, history is what happened in what order. And again, most of you are familiar with that related to Christmas. But we want to look through that to what what is Luke trying to communicate to us about God? And this is really important because if you're in the room and you're working through conflict internally or externally, I want you to hear today what Luke's going to tell us about God. And this is really important because if you hear it, and not just hear it, but you believe it and apply it, 
God can help. God can help. So before I jump in, uh, just a little piece of history that we can look through to maybe see something that Luke's wanting to tell us about God. We know from history that around this point in time when Luke was writing this letter, around him in Asia Minor, there were a few cities that decided and then it became adopted by pretty much everyone that we're going to celebrate someone's birthday every year. Not just for him individually, but for us all together. We're going to celebrate this birthday. And we have actually still in stone and and on monuments some of the records about this person. And so I want to read you one of the quotes. I'll read you a few of them actually. Here we go. The birthday of the God marked the beginning of the good news. That's the word euangelion. The good news for the world. Another monument on stone, the divine blank, son of a God, savior of the whole world. Does this sound familiar? This person is, anybody know? Caesar. Sounds a whole lot like Jesus. Maybe Luke is trying to help the people around him look through history to some theology that he wants to communicate. But here's the big deal about Caesar for the people in Rome at the time. He was not the first person that was referred to in these ways. But he was the person that was lifted up, exalted and praised for bringing peace on earth. The one that they thought was the ender of conflict for Rome. In fact, maybe you've heard the words Pax Roman, uh, Pax Romana, peace to Rome. They gave credit to Caesar Augustus for bringing peace on earth. You can still go to Rome right now and visit a rebuilt altar to Caesar. It's a peace altar. In light of that history, Luke starts his story in verse 1 of chapter 2. In those days a decree went out from who? Caesar Augustus. And he's going to end his story focus primarily on a birth announcement that comes from angels. Last week we focused on the theme that church has, not just our church, churches throughout history have celebrated during Advent the theme of joy that we see in the first angel in his solo voice, good news of great joy. Today, we're going to look at the second part of this angelic announcement, and it's the voice of all the angels, and they're going to announce to us through this birth, peace on earth. Y'all with me? All right, stand in order to honor God's word. We're going to start reading in verse 8. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great Fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, this is a multitude of voices, read it with me. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened 
which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the sayings that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who had wondered at what the shepherds told them. What, sorry, excuse me. All who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. We're going to pray. I'm going to invite you to your knees. If that's uncomfortable, you can just sit down. I'm going to invite you right now to just talk to God yourself. And I I don't know what conflict you're having at at this moment in time, but maybe, maybe it's related to work, maybe it's at school, maybe it's in your home, maybe in your heart. Maybe the conflict in the world that you're watching right now. I, I want you to just talk to God about it for a second. Maybe that conflict is because of your sin. You're rebelling against God, and you know that. Do you want to just confess that to him right now? Open up the door for communication. Say, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Jesus said before he left that he was going to give us the Holy Spirit to guide us in truth. So would you ask the Holy Spirit to do that right now, to guide us as we walk through God's word? Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. This week, second half, last week, if you missed it, you want to hear what the one angel said about the good news of great joy, go back. But we're going to go forward now. Start with me in verse 13. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude. Someone have a different translation there? What does your, your Bible say instead of multitude? Armies, what else? Yeah, great, yes, great number. There, there, there's a, a great company, I think some of you said. This is a lot of angels. Peter in chapter 1 tells us that what God has done for humans through Jesus, the angels long to look at it could it be that all the angels in the universe showed up in the sky that night blocking out the stars above the shepherds and with one voice told the shepherds not just the history what's happening in the manger in Bethlehem. But they shared with them the theology behind the nativity, what, what, what really is going on in heaven related to the moment of Christmas. So in order to help you picture what's happening, I'm going to play a clip out of Handel's Messiah and show you a few renderings of this moment Imagine with me hearing this happen.
can you imagine being the shepherd in the field? Glory to God in the highest. Let's look at the angel's words here. Glory to God. The word glory is the word doxa, which we get our word doxology from. Literally, praise, exalt, magnify, glorify. Other places in scripture, we see it in other ways. Rejoice in God. Glory to God. When God sent his son, Jesus, to earth, God glorified himself that day. God was receiving glory. Now, it's not all they said. If that was all they said, it would be enough. But I want to keep going, and then I want to combine them. And I want, I want to talk about just how, how sometimes, for me anyway, I, I struggle to combine them. So, glory to God in the highest. And then he says, on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. God, God in his pleasure, he, he's wanting to offer something to people here on earth for their good. For your good and for my good. And this is the, the theology behind the nativity. And, and th this is crazy to me. The theology behind the nativity, God's glory and our good. Now, these two things, if you've grown up in church, you've probably heard about God's glory and our good. And for me, frankly, I wrestle sometimes God's glory and, and our good. Why? Well, I'm going to give you just an example. I was taught when I teach the Bible to start with, hey, I've got a problem, and I have a lot of them, so y'all learned that. <laughs> Not hard to start there. And we all have this problem on some level, don't we? Well, well, well does, does God have anything to say about it that can help us, that would be good for us? But in my own heart, as, as a as a communicator of, of the Word of God, there's, there's, a, there's a seeming conflict that I have sometimes, thinking, wait a minute, this is not about us. This is about God. The divine creator of the universe is in our midst. The judge of the living and the dead, who's holy and righteous and just. Is it, is it bad to talk about our good, how he can help us? We see in the angelic announcement and we see throughout scripture and, and it brings me joy that God's glory in our ultimate, let me run with this, ultimate good. Now here, here's where this can mess up. If you think that what, what you want in your finite mind to make you happy this afternoon is what God wants for you, then, then you can start thinking that your good is actually something that's not ultimately good for you but it's definitely not going to glorify God if it's you, you understand where I'm going here but if we can see in the Bible what God has done and this is what the Bible does over and over and over again communicating to his people if we can see what God has done for our good you know what it will, will happen it will bring him glory so God's glory and our good go together not, not, not maybe what you think would be good for you, like kids. Maybe you think what would be really good for you is to get all the presents that you put on your wish list. Right? 
Maybe that's what you think. You know adults think that way too? God's glory and our ultimate good, they go together. And here's what they say. They say, glory to God in the highest and on earth, what's the word? Peace. And it's a greater peace than Pax Romana. It's much more than peace to Rome. Peace on earth. The word in the Hebrew Bible is the word shalom. It's all over the Old Testament. If you're in a Hebrew country, that's kind of how they say howdy. Shalom. Peace. What is peace in the Bible? Peace in the Bible does not mean no more conflict in life. In fact, where the word shalom shows up is so often in the midst of crazy conflict in the Bible. And so maybe you've heard us talk about this here before, but God's peace that he wants to offer us is actually a supernatural calm in the midst of conflict. It's a divine tranquility during turmoil and guess what all we've got here on earth is turmoil until he comes back right and what he announces through the angels about the nativity is that something is happening as a result of the nativity God is getting glory and we are getting something good it's peace now notice not everybody is getting it he says on earth peace among who among who? Yeah, among those with whom he is pleased. Your translation might use the word favor. Those among whom or on whom his favor rests. Now what is he saying here? We're going to see it as we dig into this theology and the nativity and other passages in the Bible. But here's what we read. It's not that God is necessarily playing favorites. And he said, I'm pleased with you, I'm not pleased with you. But, but, but God is going to extend favor and grace to his people. Some receive and some do not. How does that all play out in the, the hand of God? I, I don't know, but I do know something I'm going to try to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, extend this favor, his pleasure to you today in this room. I believe that's one of the things he wants to do for you. God's glory and our good go together. Peace. We're going to talk peace. Before I do, interestingly, theologians throughout history have argued there has been conflict about what kind of peace the angels are talking about right here. Is that not... Uh, apropos can I say that word some argue that what the angels were announcing here is peace with God for those that have God's pleasure resting on them his favor his another word in the New Testament his grace his undeserved favor on them peace with God others in this conflict <laughs> argue no it's not peace with God the angels are announcing it's the peace of God that the angels are announcing that those who are are living in his pleasure in his favor in his grace they get to experience the peace of God in their life y'all hear me do this often could it not be both so I'm going to show you both in the Bible real quick. And I want you to, again, go through, again, history to the theology and the nativity and this beautiful theology in your conflict of peace that God wants to offer you through his grace. All right, here we go. First thing I want to look at, because I don't think you can have the second one, the peace of God, if you don't get the first one, the peace with God. All right? So keep your finger in Luke 2 or the guest card you filled out, <clears throat> no pressure, and uh, leave it there. Go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, let's look at one of the passages in the scripture that talks about peace with God. 
Verse 1, therefore. What's the therefore, therefore? Well, what Paul has done in the first four chapters of Romans is he has shown us that we are all enemies with God. Why? Because you and I have both chosen in our lives to rebel against God, to live life our way and not God's way. That's what I've done, it's what you've done. And the wages of sin, he says, the penalty for that is actually death. He explains it more in chapter 6, that we, we are now enemies with God. He's the author of life. We're separated from him. But God did something for us. He sent Jesus, Christmas, to live a perfect life, to die for our sin, Easter. He did that for us. So verse 5, therefore, since we have been justified I'll come back to that word it's a legal term by faith we have what we have peace well I thought we were God's enemy not anymore because of Christmas the angels announced it we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom him we not not everybody but there's a certain people group that are gonna have the favor of God in their life that the grace of God his undeserved favor resting on them verse 2 through whom we have also obtained access by faith into this what grace in which we stand so as a result of this good gift he's given to us what happens we rejoice in the hope of the what glory of God God's glory and our good, they go together. And when we experience what he has done for us that is so good, the peace that he has offered us, it overflows. They rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. What did he just say? He said that God did for us something that gives us peace with him. God sent his son Jesus to take the penalty we deserve. Y'all know Hark the Herald Angels Sing? Yeah? There's a, words in the song that go, peace on earth and mercy mild. I don't sing good, so don't listen, but uh, peace on earth. God and sinners, what does he say? Reconcile. What are the, the heart the herald angels sing? That we have peace with God. How? Well, I'm going to go back to that word justified here for just a second. Uh, with close friend, accountability partner, I've been reading a book by Tim Keller called Forgive. And this week, we were in chapter 5 of the book, and in that chapter, he was showing you how this law makes you God's enemy before Christmas and Easter, Jesus. And then this same law on the other side of Jesus makes you God's friend. How is that possible? Well, the... the the Bible outlined clearly what God gave us his law because he knows what's good for us and what brings glory to him and then we rebel against that and it actually ends up being bad for us when we do it our way not his way and it's stealing the opportunity for our lives to glorify him we become his enemy because we've rebelled but God came and he lived the perfect life in our place. He obeyed everything in this book and he died. Did he die because he deserved it? No, he died because he died for your sin and for mine. And then he gave us his righteousness, which means according to the law, double jeopardy, you can't judge that sin again. Your sin has already been judged. You have his righteousness. Now the beauty is you are at peace completely with God justified declared right by the judge because of what he has done if the favor of God rests on you how does the favor of God rest on you the Bible says it's by faith believing in what he has done his grace his undeserved favor that he offers to you so first thing you want to be at peace with God it's not just that you need to know Jesus was born in a manger Jesus needs to be born in your heart and Jesus is born in your heart when you believe and receive. Today you can do that by saying, God, I'm sorry I've rebelled. I'm hearing today that you sent Jesus. I receive the gift of peace with you. Now, if you've done that, praise God, we'll have the opportunity to talk later. Many of you have done that, and you forget it every day, like I do. 
you get stuck in the, man, oh, God's, surely God's really upset with me now because of what I just thought, what, what I just looked at, what I just said. So surely God, I, I better go the other way from God. No, you need to be reminded that because of Christmas, you are at peace with God because of what Jesus has done. You don't have to run away from him. The divine king of the universe, you can run to him. And when you do, glory to God. Second, peace with God, now peace of God. We're going we're gonna to make it back to Luke 2, but Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Paul's closing his letter to this church in Philippi. It's a letter full of joy, our theme last week. And he says in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord. How often? Always. He's saying in a different way, glorify God all the time. Praise him for what he has done. Glorify him. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness, re, re, reasonableness, there it is, be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. But Okay, now we'll, we'll stop for just a second. Last week, blogger that I follow, some of you uh, in the room do too, because sometimes you'll send me his stuff. But Jim Dennison used to pastor in a church in Dallas. Jim Dennison pointed out something to me that I had never seen. The Lord is at hand. The verses were added after the author wrote. Where's the period in verse 5 before the Lord is at hand the Lord is at hand is actually the foundation for what he's going to tell us about peace next some argue Lord is at hand means he's about to come back that should bring peace and it should we have eternity coming where none of the tears are going to be many others argue and I think it could be both Many others argue that what he's saying here is God's come through his son Jesus Christ, the incarnation, Emmanuel, God with us, right? So if, if God is with us, what can we do? We can be in communication with God. We can hear from him and we can go to him with our conflict, internal and external do not be anxious he says about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God and then what does he say and the what peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus this peace of God which surpasses all understanding literally if you just translate it literal word for word which understanding cannot produce this is not something that we can get on our own this is something that only comes on those whom God's favor rests with whom he is pleased this is something that is given to us the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus quick note here I do not think this means that Christians are never anxious I did not think that this means that if you struggle with anxiety, this means you're a terrible sinner that's running hard away from God. That's not what I think this means. I think this means that God is offering something to Christians that can be helpful when we're experiencing that. We get to, the Lord is at hand, Emmanuel has come, and through the Holy Spirit now we have conversations with him that we can go to him with the external and internal conflict in our lives and hear from him and speak back to him and be in relationship with a God who cares and can help. Do you hear that? Back now to Luke 2. Verse 14. The angels say, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. He's communicated to his people. They've heard from him. The Lord is near. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They heard from him in communication with God through his angels. That would have been awesome. I, sometimes I wish that he would communicate that clearly to me. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. When they saw it, they made known the saying 
that has been told to them, what God had communicated to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary, it says, treasured up. She's thinking about now it looks like what is happening, but also what the shepherds had communicated to her about the theology behind the nativity, what they heard from the angels. Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. One of the most beautiful verses, I think, in all of Luke. Mary is having like a devotional time meditating on what God has communicated through her baby. And the shepherds returned glorifying. Y'all see, God's glory and our good go together. They respond after God has moved in a good way with praise. Glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. As it had been, again, notice the communication with God had been told to them. So what? So if the theology behind the nativity is God's glory and our good go together, what, what, one peace with God is good for us the peace of God is good for us if the favor of God is resting on us how do we experience that again this is not new theology it's not and it shouldn't be if any theology that sounds new to you you should question it but just just uh, a few quotes here history of the church Westminster's catechism right the chief end of man is to do what glorify God and to enjoy him forever how do those go together God's glory and our good go together John Piper writes God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in him how do we how do we find the peace that he wants to offer through this promise here's what we've invited through this season we've invited you Justin said it in different words earlier in our service and it's on purpose we've invited you to take time to stop in a busy season Maybe it's Advent for you at home with your family or Advent at home individually. Light a candle and to remember that Jesus came, died for you, rose again. You're at peace with him. And then enter into a conversation so that you can experience the peace of God as he communicates to you through his word and you get to cast your anxieties. What's the conflict that you're walking through? back on the one who loves you that you're at peace with in conversation with him we want to invite you no don't let this season move past without that happening this is also the time of year i mentioned it last week where we also start encouraging you and pointing you to jump into our bible reading plan next year why because like we get royalties on bibles that are sold no We, we, we want you we want you to know the joy of this God that you're at peace with speaking into your life and you getting to talk back to him the one story Bible reading plan is the one that we plan to do this next year as a church you can do other ones that's totally cool that we don't have any like copyright on Bible reading plans we are going to point you now to something after I just joked about royalties we actually have paid for a portion of it but we actually put a price tag on it because we want you to value it we've learned that it actually has more impact on your life if you pay something for it but we have a hard copy version of a devotional guide for you with that bible reading plan and then promptings for you to do an sos and it'll guide you what is that for so that you can enjoy god communicating to you and respond to him spend time in prayer casting your anxiety on and experiencing a conversation peace with God and the peace of God in your home we want to invite that for you what does that what does that look like what does that look like if you want to do that they're they're available in the connection today we we have a limited number but if we sell out we plan to buy more starts on the first we have a lot of also discipleship groups that are just going to be using that reading plan to help guide them to follow Jesus this year as they do it in the setting of we're not meant to do life alone y'all know that right Uh, in community so those will be available in the connection that's out the door to your left my right in a minute I'm going to dismiss I'm going to actually say a prayer which is a prayer that ends with peace so that's why I'm I'm holding it and kept it's part of the sermon today if if you want to talk to someone about being at peace with God you realize that hey no I'm in conflict with God I'm I'm I've not received his grace his favor doesn't rest on me I've never said yes I believe in Jesus I'm ready to follow him 
we want to talk to you today. You can text the word talk to 96123 or you can find us again in our next steps room out the door here to my left. But for many of us, many, all of us, all of us are being invited into the beauty of what the good that God has offered you and I at the nativity. The, the, the beauty of what he wants to, to, to speak into your life. Peace. Peace with God and the peace of God. And, and, and so what does that look like? In, in my own life this morning, I, I was wrestling. Uh, you've heard me talk about this already, and that's on purpose because I wanted to connect these two illustrations with uh, what do I do when I preach every day? Glory to God. Well, this will be good for you. Well, they go together, right? And one of my, my great fears, and it's something that brings into my own heart conflict, anxiety, is the fact that the Bible said that teacher, says teachers are held to a higher standard. It actually says you're, you're, you're being judged as you communicate. And the Bible talks a lot about false teachers. And so I'm like, Lord, protect our church and me from me. I don't, I don't want to teach false stuff. I know I don't. There's times where I, I'll study a passage and think, well, last time I preached it, I think I might have got it wrong. You know, I, I, and so like, I, I was in that moment of anxiety. And so then, if you read the Bible reading plan, I just, I, I'm in that moment, conflict in me. I open the word of God and I'm reading in 1 John 4. And 1 John 4 is all about false teachers. I'm like, oh, stink. <laughs> and then there's what he says in 1 John 4. He says that if anyone, if anyone says that Jesus came in the flesh, he's from God. Now, I'm not trying to puff myself up. What I am trying to say is God spoke peace into me in that moment. What? He's basically saying if anyone teaches Christmas is for real the deal, that God sent his son to die on the cross for your sin. That's not a false, I'm like, you know what happened in my heart? And I don't know where you are, but I want to invite you right now to let that peace of God wash over you. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you, what is it? peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go love your neighbor. Thank you for joining us today for Worship Online. If you're in our area, we want to invite you to come to physically connect to your local church. We would love to help you to live and love like Jesus alongside of others who are doing the same. If you're from outside of our area, can I challenge you to find a local church in your area that's going to preach the Bible and exalt Jesus? Smash the like button, subscribe, share with friends, and turn on notifications if you'd like to stay up to date with us. And thanks again for joining us.